Welcome, welcome, guys. We're here for another edition of The Lock-In. We have a very special guest this week. We have a high-stakes pro. He's a cash game beast. He's also an MTT beast as well. He is the founder of Soul for Y Academy. He's a great poker coach. Berkey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So great to have you on, Matt. Dara, also a very warm welcome, as usual. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's good to be back. It feels like we're doing, doing this all the time now. Yeah, we've done loads of shows now. We don't even mention how many. It's been so no, many. It's great. No, I, I lost count. I had to ask you recently, actually, how many we had. Yeah. And oh, if no, you, you, could, you could have said almost any number and I would have believed you. Yeah, the time does pass both slowly and quickly at the moment. It's hard to yeah. know what's going on. Um, okay, we're going to dive straight in. My first topic this week is the World Series of Poker in December. They've sort of pulled a rabbit out of a hat here. We, we thought we'd finish with the World Series this year, and now they've just decided that it didn't really happen and it's going to happen again. Um, fair play, you know, obviously they uh, they need to line their pockets. They didn't make enough off the first one. So, you know, off they go. Um, I was interested to see, I, I, I wrote down some of the details. So what they're going to do is they're going to have one on WSOP.com. So that's a um, local one or a kind of a national one for the Americans that can be played in New Jersey, Nevada. Action begins on Sunday, December 13th, and it continues on December 14th. And then the final table will actually go live. This is the interesting part. And I'm going to get to this in a bit more detail in a moment. It's going to go live. They'll play it in the Rio on Monday, December 28th, just after Christmas. Simultaneously or sort of simultaneously, GG will do their international leg of the same event. So same partners as last time round. They're going to play theirs on the 29th. There'll be loads of legs to that one. Um, it will continue on all the way till the 5th. There will be a final nine players decided upon on Monday, December 7th. And then those last nine will go to the beautiful uh, uh, Ros Vegas, uh, Rosvedov in the Czech Republic, which is totally not being ravaged by COVID right now. Um, and and then, then they'll get to play live, which I assume will be a fantastic experience for all. The winner of both of these things are actually going to end up playing in a in a heads up game of their own. And I'll get to that in a moment, but I'll, I'll start with you, Matt. What I'm finding very weird about this one is the sort of um, almost denial of the pandemic world we live in with yeah. this live component whatever about another online game i'm sure we could have all bitched and moaned and sent our tweets about them you know gouging the market if it was another online 10k whatever but this live component is just plain weird right um yeah i understand what they're trying to accomplish from both a business and branding standpoint i guess uh from a business standpoint there's just demand you know we're, we're all facing a second wave, we're all going to be locked in again. And, uh, you know, the, these things are just very popular. WPT is doing really well on party poker. Um, GG has been hosting a bunch of events and they're doing really well. And I think that they're trying to find a way to bring rest of the world together with, uh, you know, the national level of America. But yeah, I mean, I just, uh, it feels a little bit dirty to, to run the live final tables. Now I'm saying this and it's, it's a little bit contradictory to me because I also just played Poker After Dark twice last week and I felt pretty safe. Uh, you know, we did rapid COVID test prior. Uh, it was a clean set. Everybody had to wear a mask off of set, et cetera, et cetera. But still, I'm, I'm young and willing to gamble a little bit in those environments. And I'm sure that anybody who plays these events will be, but like, you know, there are going to be some elderly people who get in here and very well could make the final table um it's a pretty bad caveat to uh like if you final table and you test positive for covid you just auto dq like yeah that was i was going to come to that now is that there is an automatic disqualification the, the words in the rules are any player who tests positive for covid19 prior to the start of the final table will be disqualified and receive the minimum final table payout so not even getting their chips blinded off right they're just gone which yeah. is super harsh yeah, yeah, that's pretty brutal. Uh, I do think that they have an out, though. And this is kind of nice because it is such a big prize pool. Um, now, granted, it would be a really big stain on calling it the main event. But if the COVID thing can't happen, they could just effectively ICM chop the final table. Uh, it would be that terrible. But my, my gut tells me that if we do face a second wave where they can't do it live, they'll just delay it. They'll delay it and, like you know, if it's the first event of the 2021 World Series where they play it off, uh, they, they just will, I think. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's 
unique times. It's unique times that we're living in. Dara, I have to say, our good pal Barry Carter might have won Twitter uh, as it, as we were all taking the piss and satirizing what's going on with uh, WSOP. Scotty Wynn photograph. It's going to be all over, baby. He Barry Carter decided, you cough, it's all over, baby. Yeah, there was a lot of funny tweets going around for sure. Stuff about antibodies as well. If you've got antibodies, obviously you can charge more markup. Um, <laughs> It's it is very very bizarre. Um, you, you guys have already mentioned the disqualification rule for if you test positive for COVID. That sort of, I mean, the November nine thing, you were very heavily incentivized to make sure that you stayed in good shape for those months. This this is even more so because uh, if you test positive for, for something which is going around and lots of people are getting, uh, it massively affects your equity. I was actually thinking the other day if I if I would want to play this tournament or not because like I obviously normally play the main event. Um, <clears throat> And I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of weird because it'll still be a good tournament, um, but you kind of want to come 10th. Uh, but then you don't either, because <laughs> if you're going into a tournament and you're thinking you don't want to make the final table and figure out whether you could even fly to, to, to Rosvedov at that point, um, that's not necessarily a good mindset to be going into the, into a tournament with. So it's it's a difficult one to juggle. Um it's certainly a very weird event. I also feel for Stoyan, the guy who thought he won the main event. Uh, apparently, they've quietly burned his banner now. Um, so that is very, very sad. Uh, I do feel for him. Well, on that topic, Thomas Keeling was absolutely brilliant. He said, uh, it's interesting that Real Kid Poker signed this. This was a little uh, certification of you are the world champion of poker 2020. He said, after all, Real Kid Poker knows how it feels to uh, have a title and then have it taken away. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> ruthless ruthless but i have to say i i, I was kind of weirded out by because i immediately yeah. went on to rosvedov's website and was slightly put off by the fact that rosvedov closed about six weeks ago saying it will be back open in two weeks and then there's a new message saying oh, it'll be two more weeks and then there's a new message saying it'll be the 5th of december so <laughs> i'm not sure if they even think that they'll be able to open that as i said at the start czech republic's probably the worst hit country in europe per capita right now yeah it also seems like it could potentially be an issue with um uh like i'm not sure if americans would be allowed to even necessarily fly to all these I, i'm not sure what the uh what, what the rules are as far as like visas and things like that go right now i know that like we're not letting a lot of people in uh and I, i'm sure that like a lot of countries are strict like that maybe that's why they chose kings to some degree i know that they have a working partnership too and that that makes some sense but it it seems dangerous it seems uh like quite a risk um you know and it's not like americans aren't playing on gg uh, one way or another, like it's pretty feasible that an American could win the G or final table of the GG event, and then you know we're going to have other issues to deal with. I have to say, just as a side note, I love how you put it there, Matt. That's uh, you know Americans aren't taking people in. I think it's quite clearly the other way around. <laughs> Nobody wants yeah, it should be. <laughs> it definitely else. should be. It's a quarter of the cases in the world. Right. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on. I was a little bit worried we wouldn't have a funny story this week. And then, of course, um, you know, the poker gods provided uh, Polk and Negranu battling away. In fact, at the time of recording, Negranu is winning by a couple of hundred K, about five buy-ins. But there was a little bit of storm in a teacup there just the other day, which caused a bit of hilarity when Bill Perkins, obviously somebody who has quite a substantial side bet in all of this, tweeted, match delayed due to disagreement over rules. One party, Doug Polk, thinks it's OK to manually enter in hand history to software and have frequency analysis done. And the other does not, Daniel. Big disadvantage that Dean Eggs has not been doing this. It's Phil Galf on time. Phil is obviously the sort of referee in any disputes they might have. It's fair to say that the Boker Public writ large did a synchronise LOL when this came out. Dara, why was this such a spurious tweet? I mean, it's like, I, I, I mean, obviously Bill's a very sex, successful man in his own area, but in, in poker, he just seems to be so far behind the times. I mean, it's like he's never heard of HUDs or analysis <laughs> software or any of the software that's around poker. And it's suddenly been explained to him that you can you can do this stuff. And he's doing the typical reaction of a lot of very rec um, inexperienced recreational players at the start and go, holding their hands up in horror saying this is terrible. Um, it's very bizarre to me that he 
he, he he thought this was such an issue and i mean he he's he said that dnx thought it was an issue as well i mean i can't imagine that dnx saw anything wrong with a guy putting the literally writing the hands into a computer and working out how the guy is playing as a result it just doesn't seem i mean that that's essentially poker you you look at how your opponent is playing and you work it out um, it seemed like a real storm in a teacup it sure did well doug responded angrily with a series of tweets of his own he said okay this is completely ridiculous and we're talking privately but if you're going to fire off tweets let's talk about it the rules were no hand histories and no hoods we both agreed and we're clear on that neither have been used now today daniel messages me asking more or less a question data mining is against in Nevada, I'm not very sure how the term data We agreed to take it, but does that include, for example, writing down how often you see that? Seems pretty reasonable. I responded saying I view data mining as the automation of hands to provide data, i.e., a computer with a scraping of the screen uh, to giving you frequencies. I then said I look at the replayer on WSOP to check how many times he opened a button or three bet my open each session again. The very like you could nearly do a pen and pen like the very fair stuff like just to just to quickly glance at like oh he's opening x percent and sort of working out a range as a consequence now perkins tweets again this is doug one party thinks it's okay to manually enter in hand history to software and have frequency analysis done i did not enter any hand history into any software i opened up the client and looked at how many times he folded his button matt what's your take on this one um <clears throat> i I understand, I guess, where Perkins is coming from technically. It's just, you know, he's a little he's a little happy with his Twitter trigger finger, I would say. Uh, it seems like he gets, like, partial information and then just, like, fires out publicly. Um, I, I get what they initially had a disagreement about. It was just a matter of, like, you know, is Doug using trackers like PT4? Um, and, you know, in order to do that, he would have to be scraping in some sort of format, whether it's automatically through uh, some sort of algorithm or he just like outsources it to a team of people who write down every hand, whatever. The whole point was that they just agreed that data mining was not going to be acceptable here. But I think they both also came to terms with the fact that like if they were to hire teams of people to uh, transcribe every single hand history and put it into a data tracker like that, it was fine. So, um yeah, I, I think Perkins, you know, it was much to do about nothing. Uh, well, therein why it's so weird is that, you know, you, you say sc screen scraping, and of course you can do that from the game in which you're playing, but you can mm -hmm. also just do that from, you know, uh, being an observer as well. You know, like, yeah. that, that's why none of this is policeable and seems so weird in the first place and why Doug was sort of in the right in, in, in the initial sort of argument, but then in the end gave in because he probably figured, well, I can do the analysis I need anyway. And there is absolutely no way Negreanu has hired this crack team of clearly very good heads up specialists that he has. He's not revealing who they are, but he says they're among the best and they're not doing this kind of work for him. Like they should be fucking fired if they're not right Dara. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that is the thing. It, 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 this has taken on almost the dimensions of a chess match where, um like at the top levels it's not really just player versus player it's a team it's team versus team and the backgrounds the back office staff are incredibly important to the enterprise and that and, that, and that's just the basic stuff they should be doing i mean obviously they helped daniel because he's not a heads up specialist at the start um presumably with some coaching but there should be um in running analysis going on too about the way doug is playing um and how they could possibly exploit that and counter exploit that and also look for possible leaks or, or, or whatever in Daniel's own game, which might be um, creeping in. Daniel has been around for so long <clears throat> that even, even if he's gotten very specific and good coaching on heads up, it's likely, you know, that under pressure, old, pre old habits might come back in um, just the way tournament players play heads up. Um, so he, he, he he probably had to unlearn a lot of stuff as well, I imagine, in his coaching. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, the back that 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 is the role of the back office staff to uh, to, to analyze the game and running. 
Absolutely. Well, look, it is important to note here that Negrano has backed down and uh, he, he did a little Twitter thread of his own. He said, most importantly, there is no accusation whatsoever of malice on Doug's part. He didn't do anything wrong, but what he was doing was something I wasn't doing. So, OK, whatever. They, they've let it go and moved on. I have to say, I'm tweeter on this one and it was absolutely gold for me. I just think it's maybe one of the, the best ever tweets ever seen by any poker person. It was Bill Jaffe, who did the little sort of deadpan to camera it was just so pure if you haven't seen it check it out guys but there was comments like hey bill stay in your lane uh, i know you're trying to die with zero but you know you keep this shit up you might end up living with zero um and then just because you uh just because you do uh just because you go to the galapagos once a year and do acid with the turtles doesn't mean you get to weigh in with these kind of things with these echelon of players i just thought it was absolutely pure but uh yeah look uh you know common sense prevailed in the end and uh, these guys are gonna battle away for what we would assume at the rate they're going now is going to take about four years hopefully they can step it up a little bit and, and play maybe a little bit uh, more than two hours a day three days a week or whatever it's been so far anyway yeah i tuned in last night and it was it was already over um it was uh, they're not they're, they're, they're not exactly working long sessions it seems like no, it was like 200 hands, maybe 250. You're lucky. It's really snail space. Yes. But anyway, um, as it stands, Daniel is doing quite well. He <laughs> five buy-ins down about four sessions ago, and now he's five buy-ins up. But these are the swings you're going to see all the time. Um, we're we're, we're going to find out if Doug's 10 big blind per hour uh, or per, per 100 hands is going to actually uh, start manifesting as the, the, the sample size grows. Um, next topic, competition in poker. Um, this one is always interesting to Darren and I, and I'm really keen to get your input on this one, Matt. Um, betting company mergers, that kind of thing is going to be part and parcel of this chat. As poker players, first and foremost, you know the competition is necessary if we're going to get a, a fair shake, really, and you know, in an environment where there has been less competition, for example, when Stars had such a big monopoly five, six years ago, you certainly felt like without any competition or meaningful competition for them, we were definitely being taken advantage of to some extent. In the last little while, in fact, as of the 5th of May, Stars Group, of course, merged with Flutter, which itself is a merger of Paddy Power and Betfair, um, and the parent company of FanDuel. Stars obviously merged, sort of merged with Full Tilt, and I think they took on a lot of PKR players over the years too. So they're very much a, um, a, a sort of super company in, in themselves. So now they're a super duper company. Uh, that deal finally went into action in May, but it actually was sort of suggested back in October. And I'm really interested now, sort of a year since we knew it was going to happen and six months since it happened, what are the impacts of this super company and what are we starting to see in the landscape of the offering within regulated poker? The, the regulated market is tough. It's really difficult to see or project uh, what's going to happen because I think that you know, the greatest competition is the unregulated market. They're, they're just kind of, I mean, the rise of GG is like nothing we've seen. And I think uh, comparable to that are like the apps that are catching on like wildfire. I know Poker Bros literally sprung up overnight and uh, has just been absolutely killing it during this pandemic. So it's difficult to see the trajectory of poker, but what's very obvious and what I think Stars understands better than most is that sports betting is 100x the market of of poker and uh there's a lot of overlap there so it's just a nice funnel for them to move their poker playing clientele over to the sports betting market over to the dfs market like these much more much larger um pools i guess where there's just infinitely more capital to move and uh, a lot more profit to make um i'm kind of curious to see how this will impact DFX, DFS uh, almost more so than poker. Because DFS, like, it had the rise of popularity immediately. But with it getting outlawed in a handful of states and then also with the multi-entries, it seemed as though the, the common thought process was that it's just absolutely unbeatable outside of, like, maybe the top 1%. So I'll be curious to see if, uh, you know, this influx of money, these larger companies like Stars Group, um, maybe manipulated in such a way where it's it's open to the to the every man again mm. 
Well, I watched Robbie Straczynski's episode of The Orbit a couple of weeks ago, and actually he put a similar sort of question to guests, including Chrissy B, Tony G, and uh, Pliska from the WPT, which are a pretty good lineup, actually, of people who might be able to offer opinions. But I, I never felt like they fully got to grips with the question. And that's why I kind of wanted to redo it here with you guys. Um, I think the positives, and there are positives and negatives, I think the positives are clearly about regulation. You know, if, if there's a more simplified market with less people in it, you can maybe wrangle people around a, a sort of a, a shared set of values and maybe encourage governments or regulators to sort of, um, you know, ac accept them in the market under certain agreed conditions. The other one, which I think you kind of hinted at there, Matt, I want to put to you, Dara, um, is this notion that within a super company, so if your poker wing is like, you know, maybe a single digit percentage of your overall machine. In fact, in a lot of these companies, it's a small single digit too, that it becomes more of a Trojan horse to get people in the door to essentially do daily fancy sports and sports betting and all the things Matt just said. And I suppose that's a little bit like what it is in a real casino. In a real casino, the poker room probably makes the least amount of money for the casino, but it's a great driver of people in. And then they might spunk some money off on blackjack or make a sports bet in the book or whatever they might do as well. And do you feel like maybe the positive thing for poker is that it might start to be run not as a profit model, but as maybe a, a customer acquisition model? I mean, that's possible. <clears throat> um, I would also say that historically, it's not all bad for poker. I mean, you talked about it being a door to get people into the other stuff, but it's a two-way door. Um, I used to deliberately prioritize Euro sites that were essentially bookie sites um, because you had a lot of people who were, you know, they were betting was their sports betting was their main thing um, and i'm talking about recreational sports betters now not uh, the professionals and you know if they've had if they had a bad day at the race or whatever they'd come into the in, in onto the poker site um and a lot of the value came from there that seems to have dried up in recent years i'm not sure why um that is um whether it's just they don't market it the same way at those people or they the industry view has changed and they actually just want those people to stay in sports betting um but there is potentially that 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 could be uh, good for poker. But I do worry that uh, if, if if poker becomes less profitable, then there'll just be less budget put at it. And I mean, we've already seen. You mentioned Paddy as one of the main poker's now. If you go back ten years ago, Paddy Power were actually the main uh, online poker site in in Ireland. They had bigger market share than either Full Tilt or Poker Stars at the time, and they were very good at getting recreational players in. Um, they came to the conclusion somewhere on the middle of the decade that poker just wasn't worth it. Um, and they switched to a system that they refer to as MVP, minimum viable product. And there is the danger that even giants like stars might do the same thing. They might see themselves primarily as just, well, we want to offer poker, but we, as soon as we get them into poker, we want them to go into casino or the other stuff. Um, that would be my big concern. So it has been good to see more competition on that front. Gigi coming on the scene, aiming very squarely at poker. Um, I remember a conversation I had, it must be seven or eight years ago, uh, it was before the MA takeover with some players here in Dublin, um, talking about how dangerous it was, as I saw it, that, how dominant Star's position was after the demise of Full Tilt. Any industry where somebody rises to almost monopoly levels, and I'd seen it in lots of different tech sectors I worked, effectively, once that happens, it's game over uh, for the industry. The, that, that, that site becomes less focused on uh, providing value for customers and more focused on monetizing those customers as much as possible because they can't really go elsewhere. So it is good to see somebody uh, giving them a proper run for their money. I mean, there's been talk about this for the past few years, but really nobody has done it until GG came along. Very good. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, one final question maybe on that one, Dara, as well, is that you, you mentioned there, obviously, the, the, the situation where Stars had maybe 2014, 2015, had maybe 70%. I think that was sort of the number that we were being told, which is an extraordinary number um, within the industry. They'd, of course, uh, absorb full tilt at that point. But in the last few years, you, you have seen a steady rise by party who sort of, you know, chipped away. You've seen this sort of fast lane move by Gigi in the last couple of years. 
obviously our backer Unibet have grown exponentially. They've actually exploded, but from a very small base, admittedly. So they're sort of trying to incrementally get themselves into the the, the main tier, if you like. But that will be a, a longer journey, one would think. The, the, they're quite um, steady with how they kind of manage growth. So I think that's kind of an interesting uh, approach overall that they're taking. Um, and, and, I, and I think they, they sort of have a, a value system, almost a little bit like... Um, the the nittier poker player who wants to sort of build it up incrementally wants to sort of make a little bit uh, <laughs> you know grow their market share grow everything at a very steady pace not take too many risks of, of going bust or whatever in the meantime and you know obviously within kindred and within unibet the poker you know like i said earlier is only this like small couple of percent sliver growing as it is and growing a lot in 2020 but um i'm just interested to know like how, how do you feel as a player specifically about the offering you've received um, in terms of like maybe the spread of tournaments that you get, maybe the, the rake, maybe the, the structures that are offered. It did feel like we'd, we'd reached a sort of a bottom in 2015. Has it sort of improved as a, a range of games, a range of offerings? I think it has improved uh, because the, the sites are offering different things. Although, I mean, in some ways, the sites just kind of are all different versions of each other. Um, there are some sites where PKOs are predominant. There are some sites like Unibet where the more traditional tournaments are still dominant. So I guess there's some differentiation there. Um, um, and obviously, I think the big change that we've had in the last few years is just re-entries. Um, stars always historically were very um, opposed to the idea of re-entries and sort of held the line for as long as they could on that front. And now they've sort of, uh, they don't they don't hold the line anymore. So the way we did definitely see the industry go far too re-entry happy for a while where everything was an infinite re-entry and that was being used to inflate prize pools as player numbers were dropping. But the unfortunate thing with re-entries is that it redistributes the wealth much faster away from the um, the recreational players. So it was really, really bad for the ecosystem. Um, since, uh, since, since the rise of GG, I, I mean, in some ways they're, they're kind of just doing the same uh, as stars do, you know, they, they, they start a couple of PKOs on the half hour like stars do. They start their main normal tournaments on the hour and the, the the offerings are very similar. It's just sort of a direct competition. Now their software is is uh, is very good, and recreation more importantly, recreation is like it and enjoy it. They 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 put in a number of innovative features, but in terms of the actual baseline offering, I don't think there's been much innovation really in the last few years. Um, there was a period where there seemed like a there was a lot of innovation when you know when Zoom came on when. Um, when lottery sit and goes arrived on the scene and when PKO started to predominate, but it feels a bit static on that front recently to me. Mm, that's fair. Okay. I want to change tact a little bit now and go to a story that we wouldn't normally really cover, but there is a good reason for it. I promise. Um, just about a week ago, um, the 2020 mid stakes poker tour MSPT Venetian 1100 main event was won by really big up and coming player Landon Tice. He's sort of Joe Ingram's protege of sorts. He was the place for over 200K, a marquee result for him, and probably the first of many, given uh, how much there are people who back him so, so highly these days and, and think he is one of the best players up and coming. Uh, Tice has lasted 1,100 players, so extraordinary uh, effort by the guys. Matt, I want to bring you in on this. You said in the past, I think the common link is coming to emotional responses during problem solving. So many people action based upon what they want or hope to have happened and later to justify that action through flawed logic. And I was thinking about that. That credited you. It was it was Landon being quoted in an interview, and he said, uh, "When I lost the chip lead slightly after a massive pot, I got very nervous. I felt a momentum shift and lost some confidence I had the entire way through." He had been kind of stomping everyone. Uh, after that pot was a break, and Berkey calmed me down and helped me realize the situation. Timing is everything. What did you say to him? Uh, all right. So the, the long and short of it was that, uh, so I amongst uh, a group of four of us, uh, are backing Landon. So I was there for the final table rail and, you know, he's young and he's an EV assassin. Like he just sees the game through a, a very specific lens. Um, but his, his, the majority of his background is cash. So like, he hasn't really been hurt by the game yet. 
he doesn't know what it's like <laughs> to play. Like he doesn't know what it's like to play live for three days straight and just have everything go your way where you're never below hundred big blinds and then lose three flips and just be out. Mm. Um, and I think that's kind of like what he was feeling in this event where it's like for two days straight, his biggest hiccup was like losing a flip and getting down to 40 bigs, but like he was just never short the entire tournament. He was never in push fold mode. That's remarkable, especially for like, you know, an MSPT event like this, where uh, the structure is not exactly the main event of the world series. Um, so he, he gets heads up against this guy who, you know, Landon's probably played a couple hundred thousand hands of heads up. This guy, I imagine has played about 15 in his career. And the second that they were close to even in chips, Landon wants to talk chop. And I overhear it from the rail and he's like, let's look at ICM numbers. And I'm just like, oh no, like ICM's not even a thing heads up. We're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> so luckily there was a break. I kind of pulled him away and I was like, listen, man, like you're backed. You're only getting a percentage of this anyway. You're playing heads up for 70K versus a guy that you have 20X the experience over. And, you know, we all believe in you to, to kind of just get this thing done. And getting second isn't that bad of a result. So, like, this is the ultimate free roll. This is a chance for you to kind of just, like, you know, get to work and see what you're made of uh, and, and just kind of get it done. And I, I think for him, it was more so, like, he validates himself so much in his ability that when variance kind of overtakes, it, it kind of – it steps on the validation process a little bit, right? Like if he just loses two flips to this guy and gets second place without ever discussing chop, he might feel a little bit worse off than if he had locked up a bunch of money where he could at least shrug and say like, okay, I may have failed in the regard of beating him heads up, but like monetarily speaking, we, we were the same. We just chopped it basically down the middle. Um, a lot of really positive things happened though. So first and foremost, uh, MSPT screwed up the chop. So they have a rule where you have to play for 10% of the remaining prize pool. But the remaining prize pool was 70K, not 325,000, right? <laughs> they didn't realize that like second place is taken out of the prize pool because nobody can get third at this point, right? So whenever they did the 10%, they came up with, they had to play for $34,000, which is actually 50% of the <laughs> remaining prize pool. And then on top of that, because they were using this uh, flawed model, when they did the chip chop, Landon outchipped this guy six to five. So he has like a 10% lead at most. Well, when they did the chip chop, they're doing it based on all of the money instead of the remaining 35,000. So they give Landon a 10% increase on you know the $300,000 remaining prize pool rather than on the 34K. So they offer him 159K to this guy's like 142 when in actuality, it should have been like 151.5 to like 149. And so the guy comes over and he's just like, hey, uh, you have four more big blinds than me. I just don't think it's very fair that you're getting like this 12K yeah. discrepancy. <laughs> and Landon's like, uh, yeah, okay, like whatever you think is fair. And I'm like, no, like this is our opportunity to back out of this and say no. And the guy goes, I think a fair split down the middle would be fine. I feel pretty good about this heads up match. And that just like triggered something in the kid. He's just like, you feel good about that? No, we're playing. We're just playing. Yeah. So it was it was kind of like a pretty good series of events where like even if he had taken a quote unquote bad chop, it was a really good chop for him because mm. MSPT fucked up the numbers so bad. That's so funny that they could make that mistake. And maybe out of practice because there has been too much live poker in recent yeah. uh, months, but that that's a shocking error. Dara, it, it made me think, because obviously this is in the whole realm of mindset stuff. And I, I know you're 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 keen to kind of keep privacy with your students and I wouldn't want you to break that at all but it made me think of of a student of yours I know who made a very big final table it was like a scoop main final table or one of those really big yeah. ones uh, a few months ago and of course you have the day break you have the sort of 12 hour um you know turnaround on that and he wanted a bit of a crash course you know knowing your skills there a lot of that was going to be about short stack play laddering icm all the stuff that you're particularly expert in but you wanted to bring quite a significant mindset component into it because you were very conscious that he was a younger player who hadn't been at that stage before and you were very cognizant of the kinds of things that might creep in during a four or five hour final table 
Yeah, my approach kind of was like, um, to, to put it in context, this is, this is a young guy who has an incredible natural mindset anyway. So I didn't have any concerns that he was going to blow up or anything. Uh, it, it was just the, the, the lack of experience. Um, he hadn't been playing full time for very long. Um, he had chopped a major live tournament in which he played the final table really, really, really well. And that, that was actually where I um, started working with him because I was just so impressed by him. And um, for specifically for this final table, I mean, we did some specific ICM sims on the starting stacks and just so he knew the ranges in different spots. You know, if this guy shoves on you or if this guy opens, what, what your range is. But most of the stuff that I wanted to go through with him was uh, what I would call sort of uh, worst case scenario thinking. So I, w- I, I got him thinking, okay, imagine uh, you lose a flipper firsthand and you, this is now your stack. This will be the stack that you will have to play. And let's talk about how you're going to play it, but also how you're going to deal with the fact that you've lost your, you, you've lost this amount of chips. Just get him, try to get him to imagine everything that could possibly go wrong and, and how you would respond to it. Thinking that if things didn't go great uh, on the final table, at least he, he, he would sort of mentally rehearsed and mentally prepared his, his response to that. And actually, as it worked out, the final table was quite dull. Um, he was pretty much just car dead for most of it. And that was something we had prepared for as well. Like what if a car dead, just, you have to, you have to focus on your discipline. You have to, you know, don't try to force things just because and you haven't been dealt a hand in the last three orbits. Um, you still have to play fundamentally sound final table poker. So he, yeah, I, I that I, I I thought that was important given his lack of experience, but I think even for more experienced players, it you know how often do we make a major final table in our careers? Um, and I was interested in what Berkey said in particular was that he hasn't uh, he hasn't been beaten up by poker yet. There's a lot of that too. I mean, the, you see golfers as they get older, they kind of remember all the missed short putts, and that makes the <laughs> short putt harder. I feel there's a similar thing in poker too, where you remember all the disappointments. They just kind of accumulate and if you can't get them out of your mind and just focus and stay in the moment um they they can become a a performance inhibiting feature uh, as you get older there's certainly a lot to be said for sort of being young and inexperienced and not having your heart broken uh, numerous times by this wonderful game a bit of fearlessness too doesn't doesn't hurt Sure. I think it kind of goes both ways where it's like, you know, the whole idea of ignorance is bliss is is true to a certain extent. And then uh, you kind of gain this subconscious competence that, that uh, Dara is kind of alluding to where you're at least subconsciously aware of all these negative outcomes that could potentially occur and it may impact your play. But eventually you get to a level of competent co- competence, uh, sorry, <laughs> conscious competence where you um, you kind of just acknowledge all of these outcomes and a certain level of acceptance and calm comes over you from it. I think at that point, like you're able to rekindle whatever that, that ignorant young self of you was in a much more humble way, right? Which now you don't have to worry about protecting your ego whenever these outcomes occur. You don't have to worry about the downfall of uh, all, all of the negative outcomes that could possibly happen. You just accept your plight in life and get out there and just execute, which you know, in Landa's defense, he is really fantastic at the execution process. Um, I, I don't know that I can speak to it at quite as high of a level in tournament play as I can in cash, just because he has 100x experience in cash. But it's just like he sees the spots and he just goes. And it's not one of those things where there's any sort of doubt of like, well, what if I lose this pot? Maybe, you know, that's a byproduct of uh, being staked and not having to, to play your own money. But like, that's a really great thing. That's, that's kind of the beauty of chess versus poker is there's no risk in chess. So you just get taught what the strategy is and how to execute. It's really hard for people to take that same approach to poker. It's interesting. I always think of you guys as very similar and very different when it comes to the whole coaching uh, area. Uh, very similar in the sense that I, I know like one of the buzz terms, for example, on your website, Matt, is the path to independent learning. And I know Dara would sort of hold very close to him this notion that he's he wants to teach people how to teach themselves when he's mm. sort of bringing them through sessions. However, I always think you're much more about the exploitative side of the game and Dara's more maybe rocked into the fundamental and you know both obviously very valid but I'm always kind of interested by the fact that you can have maybe slightly different views on where you get your money in poker but at the same time approach it from a very similar place which is that you fundamentally want people to be their own teacher 
um, and, and I think that's really important. I'm interested, if, would, you, would you speak a little bit more to the way in which you try to nurture that yourself, Matt, uh, through Solve for Why in the Academy? Yeah, uh, and, and to be fair, like, um, the exploitative thing is a secondary byproduct of mostly playing live. Like, the majority of the, the foundational learning that we go through is all theoretical based. Uh, I just challenge a lot more norms where, and I, I think Derek could probably speak to this too, where you can't just like accept. You can't just say like, oh, okay, we now open 2.2x because that's the agreed upon sizing that Munker has set for us and we're going to do it with this specific range. What you want to do is you want to empower people to kind of like hypothesize, test, revisit it, you know, kind of go through the scientific, scientific method of uh, understanding the ins and outs of this game because it's a very chaotic system. And in the live realm in particular, the reason why large win rates are so readily available by comparison to online is because of the egregious errors that are being made. And if you're heavily focused on having the exact correct candidate to make a call or, uh, you know, running bluffs every time you have the, the proper removal uh, in, in your hand or whatever, you're just going to totally be ignoring all the other information that is readily available to you. There are plenty of spots where it's like you could have the absolute best bluffing candidate in your range, but you just shouldn't pull that trigger because this type of person only gets to the river with value. And there are plenty of other spots where it's like these guys are just like infinitely too wide and we can start value betting all the way down to like ace high on, on board textures where in a good theoretical realm, we might only be betting the like middle pair for value. That's really interesting. Dara, how did you feel about my comparison about the, the two of you being both similar and, and different? Yeah, I, I think we're probably not as different as you suspect. I mean, my my original approach to game theory, let's say, was when I started playing outside Ireland at big tournaments and I realized that I was just up against, in some cases, players who were better than me. And I needed to come up with a strategy whereby essentially they couldn't exploit me. And that, and that, and, and that was sort of my whole starting point. When I coach people now, I do try to give them a fundamentally sound game, theoretically sound strategy, but that's really just the starting point. Um, back when HUDs were more of a thing, um, I mean, you used to say, you you watch me play online and you used to say that I used a HUD better than anybody you'd ever seen. And that was, I was literally parsing stat, statistics in real terms to work out in real time to, um, to work out exploits. That was mainly what my online game was based on back then. Now more and more sites don't allow HUDs and you do find yourself in a situation where you're looking at 10 tables and you don't know how the players on each of the 10 tables play. So you so you do sort of meld back more towards a game tier, a GTO one size fits all strategy. But nevertheless, you, you can pick up some th things, you know, you'll see people do something screwy. And um, a lot of my coaching is actually once somebody has got the fundamentals is telling them what to look for um, and and if they see something, how how they exploit that something. Um, you know, if you see a guy who's always see betting 100%, uh, then you play very differently against that person uh, than if it's a person who only seems to see about 33%. Uh, and and that's that's that that that's purely into the realm of exploitative poker. I do think the biggest edges come from exploiting uh, rather than game theory my as i said my original idea of moving to game theory was just so that I, I i wasn't losing or i wasn't losing too much the players that i perceived as being better than me and i didn't i honestly couldn't understand their strategy or how figure out how to exploit it so i was essentially playing for a draw that's a great counterpoint about your hood use actually uh yeah and i, and I, I stand by what i said then uh, watching you use the hood sort of side by side when we played a couple of sessions actually we very rarely played uh in, in the same place usually a hotel room on a, on a poker trip but i was always just blown away by how you would very quickly parse that data uh to to, to do something that actually looked kind of mental to be honest sometimes but was just absolutely perfect for that specific opponent and made an awful lot of sense um, so yeah, no, excellent counterpoint. Uh, I, I, I take you up on that. Um, finally, guys, I wanted to end with maybe just a little call back to our last show. I don't know if you saw this show, Matt, but we had Brian Paris on and we did, we, we did something we almost never do, which is we talked about politics, but we didn't do it in a dangerous way that was going to turn off half the audience because we're, we're too sensible for that. We decided to talk about the betting lines and the statistical stuff and the polling stuff. Um, and it made for a really entertaining conversation and actually one that I don't think our audience, um, didn't enjoy in fact we got nice feedback that we'd sort of branched into something a little different from poker even for just a moment um obviously that election 
is done and dusted, although not in the eyes of some people. But uh, Darren and I, I think, probably maybe won our biggest bets we've ever put on something. I'm not sure if it's the biggest one, Darren, for you, but it was, it was the biggest there for me. For me. Yeah. And uh, and we were very happy, very disappointed, obviously, for Brian Paris. He he lost his bet. But uh, but I think he had some interesting points and and, and perspectives. Oh, my, Darren's laughing off screen here. But I think he had some I wasn't disappointed. Points perspective. But no, we were disappointed for him for our own pocket's sake and for <laughs> the world's sake. Um, actually, we weren't disappointed for him at all. But no, but Brian's a good guy and, uh, and I thought uh, fair play to him. He came on the show and gave his yeah. reasons for why he thought Trump would pull the rabbit out of a hat once again. Um, It hasn't happened. Although what I'm interested by is since those bets got reconciled and they have been reconciled for both Dara and I, and I think on a lot of betting exchanges, there still exists some betting exchanges where despite the fact that the race is over, you can back Trump at 25 to one and 12 to one, and you can bet the other side of that as well. You can lay roughly those same prices. You can still bet on the popular vote as well. You can still... (laughs) The popular vote for like a hundred to one or whatever. Yeah, it's, there's some yep. just absolutely mind blowing stuff going on out there, and I'm just interested to get your take on it, Berkey. One, did you have a punt on this because it seems like most poker players did? Two, have you done the thing that a lot of poker players and sports betters I know have done, and basically put their entire bank accounts and net worth and bankrolls on Biden, figuring it's like six free percent or seven free free percent or whatever they, they they what price they got, um, and then finally, um. What do you make of this notion that there's so much donkey money in the system? Let's call it that. Um, And and obviously it can completely contort markets from time to time. Uh, Yeah, I I mean, I think that election cycles are probably some of the most fascinating markets from a betting standpoint that we ever see. Uh, Obviously, most betting markets are driven by behavioral economics and nothing is more, uh, I guess, polarizing than uh, an election cycle. So it wasn't shocking to me at all because this is probably, I mean, this has to be worse than 2016. Like Trump was at that point, at least uh, perceived to be a well-to-do businessman who's going to, you know, buck the system and get the, the corporate politician out of there, whatever. But now he's been pretty exposed. So like now we're talking about like a potential tyrant versus uh, an old man who may or may not even qualify for the position. And People showed up in droves. This was the the uh, most voted on election of all time, which, in my opinion, means it's probably going to be the most bet on election of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for sharps, they just knew that the Trump line was bad out of the gate. So when Trump was coming in at like plus 250, uh, I guess he started at like, I shouldn't say started, but I guess like the, the majority of where the bets went in was like somewhere between Trump plus 150 and plus 250. Uh, and I think it closed maybe like closer to plus 300 right before the election started. The Sharps knew that that line was off and that this was going to be uh, a very emotionally driven market during the actual race itself. And Nate Silver did a really great job of actually forecasting this. I can't remember if it was a podcast or an article that I read, but he basically said like once Florida gets called, that line is going to jump tremendously in the favor of the red because um, – all of the swing states will then be start to trickle in thereafter, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, Arizona. And they're all going to come out early red uh, simply due to the fact that they show up to the polls and uh, most of the Democratic message was do mail-in voting. And at Florida was the only one, I think, that had the mail-ins counted uh, day of. So when they called, they called. But the rest of them, they were going to be contested. And uh, for people who got like the, the plus Trump line, This was like the greatest hedge spot of all time. At one point, Biden was plus 700. Imagine the hedging that, you know, it's, it's, there was just so, so, so much free money to be made. And unfortunately, like I try to stay out of politics. It's not something I find myself interested in. I don't think I'm that sharp. So I just like stayed away the entire time. I I didn't think I could predict the market. Um, At one point, Biden was like plus 250 with, uh, he was losing by 70K in Pennsylvania. And I was just like, he's going to win PA. Like I'm from there. I just, I'm very certain he's going to win this. And I tried to get a bunch of money down. I was trying to bet five Bitcoin on uh, Biden at that point, but everybody was asleep. It was like 2.30 West Coast time. (laughs) And I couldn't get anything in. Wake up in the morning and now he's minus 450. 
So like I, I would have just, you know, I basically just punted on like uh, at the time, I think Bitcoin was like 13,000. So I, you know, whatever. I just miss out on a free hundred K no big deal. Um, and speaking of free money. Yeah. I, I know the majority of my friends have like their net worth on Biden right now. Uh, one analogy that was given to me was if you could bet on the 2019 Super Bowl winner <laughs> right now at 10 to one odds, would you not just bet the house? And it's like, yeah, of course, of course. And I know that the certainty is probably about that high, but uh, I don't know. I guess I've just seen too many fixes in my day where even though this is free money, I don't want to start back from scratch because of some <laughs> wild event that occurs where Trump is in office uh, come January. Well, it, it's funny you say that because that moment uh, we had a chat group going, we were talking all about it. And, and as you say, that the, the price just swung way out and then suddenly Biden was at longer odds. And it just reminded me, there was this, this moment, it was like uh, trading places and that scene where they're just sitting there in the pit waiting to go and watching the, the price tick down on orange futures or bacon or whatever it was. And then they just scream out their price and then everyone comes to them and the thing just goes completely the other way. It just felt like a, a real life version of that. Yeah. Day. Um, yeah. which is kind of wild. And yeah, like I said, I, I, the amount of poker players actually and other people who've come to me and said, like, sh <laughs> having already done it, like not, not using me as like counsel and going, Dave, you listen to a bit of American politics, you follow it a bit more than I do. Am I irresponsible for having 60% of my net worth <laughs> on this outcome for the free 7%? And I'm like, well, like, yeah, that's a horrible bankroll sort of decision, I think. But then may, maybe not, like maybe Kelly Criterion says, if you're getting, you know, uh, sort of, if it's a seven, if you're getting a 7% shot and it's really a half percent shot or whatever the odds of, as you say, the fix being in and somehow manifesting, it, it does seem like an extraordinary amount of free money. Daryl, what do you make of this craziness before we go? Yeah, there's a couple things I would say. First of all, um, I was actually looking at this with Samir earlier today. And I mean, if you actually even look at the Betfair rules, they say it like you're not really betting on who's going to be president in at the end of January. You're just betting on who has won the election. And I mean, that's already been decided, even if uh, <laughs> it's literally done on on, on, on projections uh, uh, for the Electoral College. So even if there are, you know, faithless electors, none of that stuff can affect the payouts and yet people are still piling money on Trump apparently um you can even bet on Hillary Clinton to win the popular vote which is uh mind staggering mind staggering um so it's difficult to understand who these people are who think that this is possible that they could win those bets there has to be a, a huge amount of delusional thinking uh, on the election day the thing that really um our election night as it was here the thing that really jumped out for me is something that my sports better friends always tell me which is that people the recency bias is massive people overreact to every single event as it comes and the order in which the states were called was uh, instrumental to the way the election was viewed it was viewed as swinging towards trump um and then he was favorite if the results come in in a different order it would have been seen as a very different election. It, it, it would have been seen as a fairly comfortable win for Biden, which essentially it was at the end of the day. He won the popular vote by 6 million. But because, you know, Florida came in, that was one of the battleground states, and that's the one which Trump happened to win. The election looked a lot closer. Um, some of my sports better friends, actually most of their exploits are literally just countering this sort of natural overreaction. I have one guy who, bet, who always bets. He, he bets primarily on rugby matches. And if one team scores early, he bets the other team. Um, because the market, in his view, always over adjusts to that early score. Um, there are similar things in horse racing. You know, there are certain horses which always start very fast, and uh, you can lay them in in running when they're at the at, at, at the at their peak. They're far just ahead, but they always come back to the field. And we we saw that. I mean, the the market just bounced around incredibly. I it was an academic exercise for me, but I. At different points in the night, I thought, okay, now the price is definitely wrong and it's going to move the other way in the in the very short term because uh, there was stuff like, for example, when it was coming down to five states, um, the price on either candidate didn't reflect the what, what, what it should have done, the sum of probabilities of them winning the, the, the correct amount of states they needed. Um, the Trump price was continually too small, in my view. Uh, based on the current data. So that suggested to me that most of the delusional money in the market was on the Trump side. Yeah, I think uh, Nate Silver mentioned that when Biden was plus 700, the, the race itself was actually a coin flip, hmm. which is wild to have uh, the market be that wrong. 
Yeah. yeah, the Cuban Americans in uh, Miami Dade certainly uh, uh, had a lot to answer for in, in in changing sort of people's perspective, even if it, if it was a, a perception that was wrong. There's so much donkey money out there. There does seem to be almost like we're living in a world of alternate realities right now. I know as poker players and as gamblers, it's sort of anathema to us. You know, we we, we have to part the fool from their money. But uh, it's almost like taking candy from a baby right now. And uh, look, I hope maybe some, uh, for the sake of the world, I hope people start coming to a, a shared, uh, agreed upon group of facts. Uh, but in the meantime, my God, we're going to make a few bob out of this. Uh, yeah, I also I, wonder if the pandemic had some sort of influence where people are just losing their mind uh, because of the year, <laughs> God, the year that's oh. in it and, and are acting even more irrationally than normal. Um, I've definitely had, I've seen, I've seen a lot of friends who I would consider very, very rational all of my life up, up, up until this year, um, start, start exhibiting some very strange behavior. Gosh, you might be right. It could be even worse. Well, that's just making us feel worse about it. But, you know, well, we, we'll comfort ourselves in, uh, in, in, in beds full of money. Guys, it has been absolutely brilliant chatting to you about Berkey, your superstar. We really appreciate you coming back on this version of the chip race on the lock-in. Dara, thanks so much as always. Take care, everyone. Thank you, guys.